Now, people have been using hydropower uh, in day to, to do the day-to-day -day course, like uh, long history uh, you, you, we can uh, trace. Say in uh, Netherlands, they have had water mills, UK, same. In even Nepal, we had very, very old water mills uh, today. We can still see in some of the remote areas. Uh, using very, very uh, rudimentary technology, people are making use of this energy to do the agro-processing mainly. Uh, with advent of uh, modernization of water technology, uh, this turbine thing came, came uh, into existence. And then we started converting uh, mechanical energy to electricity, uh, electricity. So then came the light and all that. This is, that, that becomes the history. And in many places, uh, it operated well, uh, sustainably, financially, and environmentally as well. But in many, many places, it didn't, it, it didn't do so. Uh, simply because asset was created, uh, there was a lot of uh, excitement in the beginning uh, to see the electricity, to see the light, and to be able to use some electrical equipments, you know, TVs and radios and those days. Uh, but after some time, uh, people started taking it as a public good or, you know, so it's everybody's good. So nobody's taking proper um, care of the technology uh, of the asset. Uh, and then slowly and slowly uh, things started from bad to worse. Uh, one of the main reason has been, it's not been looked at as a commercial enterprise or the, uh, you know, as something that can make profit. And that was the reason. And lately, then we were uh, able to recognize it you know, that uh, micro hydro projects must be uh, dealt as an enterprise, uh, dealt as a, um, uh, some institution that uh, that makes expenditures and that also creates revenues. And when the revenue exceeds the expenditure, then things starts becoming financially sustainable. That was a um, basic hypothesis. And under that, uh, then people started looking at uh, what's the problem. Problem was uh, most of the time micro hydro was used only in the evening and a little bit in the morning uh, for lighting and some other uh, minor utilization. And most of the time, uh, you see the it is the asset is just sitting idle, not creating anything. Then idea came up that we should be using this asset as much as possible. So agro processing came into picture, and then other various uh, applications came into picture. Uh, even to the extent that it is uh, powering some of the mobile towers in many places in the world currently, right? And so ultimately then uh, when the grid came into the village, uh, suddenly micro hydro was challenged, like should it be continued to be operated or should they shut it down and connect to the grid? Uh, but then there are certain people like us who have uh, spent a lot of uh, time in their life to micro hydro that said that, uh, or they have an opinion that this asset or this uh, should not be uh, just uh, let it go. Like we should uh, update it so that the power that is generated from uh, micro hydro can be fed into the grid and at, in doing so also make a lot of uh, money for the rural villages. Uh, because um, when you when the grid comes, actually electricity comes into the village, but the money from the village goes to the urban centers because they have to pay pay the tariff. But at the same time, if you can also send electricity to the grid, then the village also gets some uh, money back from the grid. So these are the uh, interconnections. Like uh, if you can use maximum time of the time uh, the asset to create uh, revenue then in the financial sustainability will be there and also there will be enough revenue to do all the necessary you know, taking care of catchment area and the other ecological concerns and the socio-economic developments also uh, can be funded to large extent uh, if we can make uh, micro hydro operational for say the maximum of the time maybe 23 20 if not 24 maybe 20 hours or 18 hours a day so with that background uh, I would like Dipti to uh, put on Manjuriji's slide, I guess. We can start the panelists' presentations. Okay. Um, yeah. You want to uh, add something on that? Uh, no, no, no. That's excellent. Uh, yeah. So, um, do you want to 
explain a little bit. Yeah, one, uh, so the next uh, first panelist uh, presentation uh, would be 12 minutes for all the four panelists. Uh, please uh, abide by the time slot that you are allotted. Uh, we have discussed that in the um, day before yesterday also. So try to stick to 12 minutes time slot. Manjuri ji has uh, many years, uh, ten, more than 10 years of extensive uh, experiences uh, working in rural electrifications that includes micro hydro and the productive use of micro hydro. And she has also been um, involved in project planning management. And lately she has worked uh, on electric cooking also. And actually she had worked with me in many of these projects, including community-based rural electrification in the past. So I am very happy to see, see she grown up now as a very reliable and very impressive personality in the rural electrification sector. So it's up to, it's over to you, Manjuri, make to make your presentation. I think Dipti is going to pre uh, broadcast the slides and she will make the presentation. Yes. Thank you, Amit, sir, and thank you Dipti, for, um, for supporting me in changing the slides. Uh, thank you, Amit, sir, for introduction, introducing me. I am Manjari Swista. I am currently associated with the Practical Action uh, as a consultant. And uh, I will be uh, speaking a bit about uh, how project end users support uh, micro hydropower plants um, sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, when we are introducing uh, operative end users, we normally define it as utilization of uh, modern energy uh, for the activities that can enhance economy, income, and welfare of the community. When we are talking about uh, microhydros in Nepal, a uh, majority of them are not uh, functioning uh, up to the standard. Uh, it does not, uh, they do not uh, ensure quality and reliable electricity, um, mainly due to lack of periodic um, repair and maintenance works, which are, which is mainly caused by the uh, less revenue that they have, their weak uh, cash flow performance, and also because of the poor institutional capacity that they cannot um, sustain or manage or operate the microhydros as they should be doing. And when we are talking about microhydros, we are also talking about the remote areas or the rural areas that uh, that they are electrifying. And there, there are also uh, rural enterprises and income generating activities, but they have very low productivity and less efficiency uh, due to lack of access to modern energy technologies, modern energy efficient technologies, actually, and also lack of uh, proper technical skills to, um, to utilize the technologies. And uh, most importantly, lack of awareness on electrical safety, because when we are talking about rural areas, there is mostly um, out migration of um, male members of the community. And then there are more, mainly women uh, consumers and women consumers uh, where, uh, are of uh, they have uh, pretty much uh, less uh, awareness on electrical safety, and this is one of the main uh, one of the main reason why uh, there is um, hesitance in uh, using um, energy technology. Also, next slide, please. So, why are we talking about proactive users when when we see that there is hesitance? But if, the productive end users are really necessary for increasing the use of electricity. Like Augusta said, like Amatisar said, like Dipti said, we cannot only rely on uh, lighting for for household activities only for if we want to make uh, microhydro sustainable. So increased use of electricity will definitely increase the revenue of microhydro power plants, which will in turn uh, let, lead them to better operation, smoother operation. Uh, they will have um, good cash flow for regular maintenance of the systems and then result eventually resulting into resilient systems. And uh, use of electricity will also has also improved uh, performance of um, entrepreneurs and farmers resulting in better productivity and also increased quality of products and services. In the community aspects, we can see that uh, with uh, with uh, promotion of uh, energy intensive local resource based um, enterprises, we can see that their employment opportunities are increased and uh, there is better impact in the communities with uh, cash circulation within the community and also um, there is income uh, economic uh, enhancement with the community and then with um, 
gas circulation with uh, enhanced economic um, economic um, development, we can see that horizontal and vertical linkages between the enterprises and uh, between the stakeholders have also increased, which will even which eventually leads to uh, more uh, opportunities for business creation. Next slide, please. Sorry. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, there are. Uh, I would like to talk about some experiences of. Um, a promotion of proactive end users and microhydro, which has led to sustainability of microhydro power plants. Uh, there was one project that Practical Action did uh, in 2014-15, uh, which it was called a sustainable microhydro through energizing rural enterprises and livelihoods, and uh, it was uh, it was implemented in Nepal and Odisha of uh, India also. And uh, this is a small example from Nepal's projects. We did this project in three uh, three microhydro uh, power plants in in Bagdong district of Nepal, and it was about uh, about two years program. And we could see that the income uh, per month of the microhydro has increased uh, compared to uh, what it was before the project. So, uh, so there was like. There was increase of uh, enterprises, and then there was also uh, that there was also um, worked. We also worked on on uh, optimization of microhydro power plants. When we are talking about uh, productive end users, we have to also make sure that there is reliable electricity available for productive end users. So there was optimization of microhydro power plants as well as increase of um, enterprises with different. Um, with different uh, models with access to markets, access to finance, access to technical skills. So there were different aspects of it that was done. And then there were awareness creation. So we can see that after um, uh, after uh, development of enterprises within the micro hydro catchment area, we can see that the income per month, the tariff has increased. Similar is the case for another uh, micro hydro power plant in uh, Karnali province of Nepal. It's Kamari Kola. It is 53 kilowatt micro hydro power. The uh, years are in Nepal, Nepali fiscal year. So we can we, just looking at three. Uh, three consecutive years um, tariff tariff collection, we can see that the tariff collection has increased tremendously uh, with introduction of proactive end users in the catchment area. Uh, the Kamari Kola Micro Power Plant uh, has more than 20, uh, 20 different kinds of enterprises currently, and they are running uh, pretty well right now. Next slide, please. Sorry. Oh. And besides, uh, besides microhydro's uh, sustainability, microhydro in turn also also contributes to socioeconomic development along with uh, productive end users. Uh, not only the community's livelihoods are improved, but some of the uh, microhydro um, executive committee members are also now elected into local women's agency. We can work with women consumers, women entrepreneurs, and and there are different kinds of um, different kinds of uh, enterprises, different kinds of uh, businesses that can be run using electric uh, electricity. Uh, the picture here is of Gindikola um, Micro Hydro Village Electrification pr uh, Project of Baglum. It is 75 kilowatt project, and it has a lot of uh, enterprises in its catchment area and many of them use uh, local prices and we can see that uh, there are some uh, some of them are already there the one that is in the inset is of uh, color lab a uh, photo studio and we can see that not only these com these uh, micro have bettered uh, have betterment of their own uh, revenue but with the savings they can also co contribute Towards uh, development of their own local community, with some of them, uh, some of the microhydros also providing um, providing um, supports for um, for extension of roads, for better uh, for better uh, um, environment around their own communities. So when we're uh, so, and also practical action has done another study on how energy can be used. Um, in agriculture value chain 
and we we studied uh, four different kinds of uh, agriculture value chain. One was rice, another was, uh, next slide please, Dipti. Uh, one was rice, another was um, ginger uh, and vegetable and uh, milk. So in different value chain um, phases, we can see there is, uh, there is need of energy. When we are talking about input supply, we need fertilizers. So fertilizers need to be produced. So we, we can see that. Um, we can see that there are, um, we can see there is in, uh, need of energy in input supply, there is need of uh, production, in irrigation, in harvesting, in processing, in drying, in washing, uh, chilling or cooling, and also in the marketing, in packaging, in distribution, and, and throughout the whole, uh, whole phases, there is a need for transportation. So, but even even with all of these, we, we see that there are a lot of opportunities, but there are also some challenges that that are really there when we are developing um, project end uses. Uh, one of the main is the accessibility. Uh, since we are working with remote areas, we have to see that how accessible uh, are, how accessible is the roads and then the market. When we're talking about en enterprises and end users, we have to talk about market. We have to look at the market also, then there is, talk then there is uh, communication, which is really necessary and uh, uh, access to finance and access to information is also necessary. Another, another uh, challenge that we see is affordability. If, uh, the if the technology is not affordable by the community, then we cannot, we cannot, um, cannot see a good adoption of- uh, Anjali, um, can I interrupt you? Uh, my computer went a little crazy. Which, is this the right slide you want to show? Um, the challenges one, please. Challenges one, okay. Um, somehow it's not. Uh, okay. No problem. I can I can just go through the challenges oh, okay. by myself. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Dipti. Um, another is affordability, and uh, so for affordability, we have to really see what kind of financing mechanism would be best suitable, and then there is acceptability. Are the technologies really acceptable by the community? Are we talking about how are we going to make it more acceptable? Um, since the technologies are not easily available and, and there's availability uh, connected to it, since the technologies are not easily available, then how are we also ensuring maintenance of the technologies and also the after sale services? So that kind of, um, that should be also kept in mind when we are when we are promoting uh, proactive end users. Like I said, availability is also an issue because we don't, uh, we don't easily find technologies in the remote areas and there's appropriateness and ease of operation. How technically, technical literacy is there, technical uh, skills are there, how do they find it uh, to operate? So these kind of uh, challenges are there when we are talk, when we are promoting uh, proactive end users, and we have to overcome these challenges. And so there are some learnings that we have gathered uh, with our uh, different works and researchers. And first and foremost is we need to strengthen the management community first. If we don't strengthen the management community, then they will. If the management community do not, does not understand what is proactive end users or how the proactive end users will support microhydro in itself, then we cannot expect uh, the, the microhydro community itself to understand it, about it. So, for the smooth operation of microhydros, we need to st strengthen the microhydro management community. And, and like I said before, electricity supply needs to be reliable, adequate, and and the supply quality needs to be very. Uh, very up to the standard to run three phase and single phase motors and different uh, different energy efficient technologies. Thank and you, uh, like, uh, yes. Would it be okay to wrap up like within uh, 30 seconds to a minute? <laughs> uh, just okay. just one minute, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and access to soft, uh, Access to a soft loan for farmers and entrepreneurs uh, through deprived sector lending or enabling flex, uh, flexible payments, reducing their payment sizes, uh, can be different uh, opportunities that we can we can make sure that farmers and entrepreneurs are are can adopt and afford the technologies. And then, like uh, and for the awareness creation and technology literacy, we have to make sure that that. Appropriate technology providers are also available within the area or are are within their reach, 
and uh, then the technology literacy, digital literacy, and financial literacy are also required to make sure that the consumers, especially the women consumers and entrepreneurs, can pursue uh, the use of product event users. And uh, to do to do to do all of this, uh, not in bits and pieces, but in a system approach, we have to include their voices in energy planning and as well as all of the uh, programs. So like Augustus said, uh, and uh, Dipti and Amatisar said, has reiterated, PU should be an integral part of uh, micro development, not starting from the pre-feasibility or feasibility study and continue it, continue it for the smooth operation of micro to make it more sustainable. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to rush you. That was excellent. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, Matyaji, give it to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dipti. Uh, Manuji, I, I, I'm very happy to see the presentation uh, and the points that you have raised. The ecosystem under which micro hydro has to operate those five years of you know, challenges of five years and various aspects and that becomes the inputs to the micro hydro powers uh, in a project development and most important of it is that uh, what micro hydro really gives at the end is like economic development social economic, and the social economic development on top of that you have also highlighted the empowerment that it can bring to the you know deprived section of the society uh, mainly the women and the you know socially marginalized uh, communities also can get benefit from the uh, this kind of project. Thank you very much, uh, Mandirji. And to all the participants, I uh, I have a message in the chat box. I forgot in the uh, first introduction. Uh, please, uh, if you have any queries uh, or questions, uh, comments, suggestions, whatever you have, uh, please uh, you can log it into the log it into the chat box, uh, which uh, in this which will be you know, taken up in the second round by the panelists. Uh, um, the plan is to let all the four panelists uh, complete their first round of presentation, and then we will scrutinize all the chat box uh, queries, and then uh, each panelists will go through the chat box and then see the relevant questions that is uh, directed to them, and we'll try to answer to that. And if the time permits, then we will see among the participants uh, uh, we have some very, uh, you know, experienced people around. I see it. Uh, what I will do is, if the time permits, we'll request some of the participants to uh, make their brief, you know, one minute or two minute remarks. Thank you. The next is uh, from Ibeka, uh, Mr. Pradigd Jati, if I have pronounced it pro properly. Uh, so he has, he's working as a pro program manager right now. Uh, in the Ibeka Foundation, uh, and he has a degree in Bachelor of Science uh, with honors, uh, and he's also a member of Mechanical Engineers Society, American Society, and similarly, he has also completed his uh, American Standard Testing and Material. Uh, he, uh, he has been actually uh, instrumental in uh, getting a project for Ibeka from uh, what is uh, African Development Fund and so on. Uh, so let's uh, hear to him, Mr. Pradigda, over to you. So I'm Pradigda from Ibeka. I'm representing Mrs. Trimungpuni and Mr. Iskandar from Ibeka. So at Ibeka, we are focusing on how to help community in enabling sustainable development and reach the self-reliance community. So basically, as in the title, we see that although the community in a remote area has less infrastructure, but still they are trying to develop some uh, capability to get the benefit from technology. So these women is actually trying to get a phone, which in their village, they don't have any electricity, and there are no signal in the deep valley. So they take the phone up at the hill when they are returning from the field. This is the reflection of the community in the remote area. Thank you, next slide, please. So this is about Ibeka. We can go through to the end. Uh, basically we are established since 
1992, and we are having the strong engineering background since the previous foundation, the Mandiri Foundation in 79. Uh, we can skip for the, the next slide. So basically, this is the history of Ibeka with the experience since 1979 by Mr. Iskandar and then continuation with the Ibeka Foundation in 1992 by Mr. Iskandar as the head of Ibeka as the founder and Mrs. Puni as the executive director. Next, please. So basically, this is the Indonesian experience for micro hydropower, where there are non-profit sector, profit sector, and the financial sector with support at each aspect. So basically, the NGO or the non-profit develop the community capability. There are the local workshop which transfer the knowledge from GTZ, SCAT, and Swiss Contact which enable to improve the engineering capability as well as the design of uh, affordable micro hydropower equipment and manufacturing capability. And then supported by financial capability, which make the micro hydropower enable to help many community in remote area of Indonesia. So basically the community are being prepared and the equipment is already locally manufactured with affordable price and then the financial capability enable the access of the fund. Thank you and next please. So basically this is the empowerment principle of Ibeka where we are trying to cultivate the local resources and local contribution from the community by starting the personal empowerment developing their motivation, self-confidence, self-valuation, self-reliance, which later will develop the structural empowerment in their organization. They can flourish more with political stability and ecological soundness, and Ibeka only provide uh, contribution which, which is complementary, so after the development, the community will do the post-development by themselves. We are promoting transparency open so they can develop the organization with their transparency and open. We are doing the development with the well dose. So basically after the post-development, the community should be already prepared for their own organization. So basically with this personal empowerment and the community empowerment, we are developing the social capital, which mentioned by Mr. Amatya, which later developed this, the structural empowerment or the organization of the community. In the technical capacity, even the experience from the remote rural villager, which did not graduate for elementary school, is able to operate 480 kilowatt uh, micro hydro power plant supplying for six villages. So basically the technical capacity of the villager is adequate as long as they have the motivation, the self-confidence and self-reliance. Next please. So basically this is the renewable energy nature. We can make the development from technical aspect, which is making the equipment becoming so automatically, but will cost very much and not economical. Or we can empower from the social only where we will wait, the community will have a degree of engineering and etc which takes a very long time and at Ibeka we are doing both and meet at the middle point so basically we are promoting the technical to be affordable as well as user friendly and how the community will able to maintain and operate by themselves 
without letting them have to acquire a certain engineering degree which takes time. So at Ibeka, we are trying to develop the technical aspect as well as the social aspect and meet at the middle point. Next, please. So basically at the Ibeka, we are trying to develop the prime mover from the community itself which they will provide participatory and contribution since the start of the construction, which led them having the on-job training for the whole timeline of the construction from six months until 18 months, depending on the construction, which then they will build their own local organization and institutional capacity which then will build their local benefit and added value as well as the productive income that they would like to develop. So one emphasized from Ibeka is that basically regarding the preparation, we always promote the villager to have their own uh, prioritizing about what is their essential needs, how to prioritize those needs, and then we make them having a community consensus about what is actually the solution of those problems. Because basically the one that already lives in there for decades, for their whole life is actually the villager itself. The villager or member of the villager must already know about the solution. And what we are trying to do is to guide the person to speak to share each other solution and how we select the best solution in a community consensus for their own future. Next, please. So basically at Chintamukar, we are promoting the pro-poor public-private partnership, inviting the private to invest in renewable energy investment. And for the next slide, we also promote the community to have the communication. So as re requested by the HPNet, the Beka present more about the communication. So basically for the next slide, uh, there is a illustration about the community radio tower and also community uh, television system, which developed in Chindamankar and also at the Chiptaglar. Next slide, please. So this is the illustration of the community radio. Next slide, next slide, please. So this is the remote community in Mount Halimun National Park, where they already developed their own television and their own radio. Next, please. This is, they developed the Chipta Glare TV or in terms of Siga TV and also the Radio Suara Chipta Glare. Next, please. And this is their broadcast uh, room, very simple with a few computer connected later to the tower and broadcasting the record in 24 hour for the community. Next, please. In the recent development, not only they already learn about drone, but the community itself already learned to make their own drone. So after they buy drone, they study it, and the leader of the community actually promote them and enabling the member of the community to build their own drone and they are accepting requests to build drones from out of the community. Next, please. This, the next slide is the Ainuso Micro Hydro Power Plan, which I mentioned before. The head of the operator is not graduated from elementary school, uh, but yet he already managed to operate and maintenance this large micro hydro power. Next, please. This is the system. Next, please. This is the turbine. And the next, please, and the panel. 
and the next. So the productive income in the in this uh, micro hydropower shown in the next slide is the electrical distillation. So basically in the next slide, we can see the electrical distillation, 42 kilowatt producing a patchouli oil uh, or essential oil. It promotes the villager to use uh, electrical for productive usage. Yes, please, next slide. And basically the furnace itself is a dual fuel, dual fuel, they can use fire or they can use uh, electricity, uh, but mostly with the abundant electricity supply, they are using uh, electricity. Next, please. This is the illustration of the patchouli oil, which is used for the base of the perfume. It has a price about $100 per kilogram in the local nearby city market. Next, please. So basically, Ibeka also promote the interconnection and policy development, which started by Mrs. Puni in 1996. And then in 1999 until 2000, there are support from Minister of Energy and providing the chance to interconnect a small 13 kilowatt community owned micro hydropower to the national utility grid. This is the start of the uh, small renewable energy, which is being on grid, started with only 13 kilowatt. And the follow up is the government regulation in year 2002, 2006, 2009, until 2019. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. We are open for consultancy or discussion by email, so we are not only answering the question in this uh, seminar, we also receive uh, an open for discussion by email. Thank you very much for your time. Please, Mr. Amatya and Dipti. Yeah, thanks, Project, uh, for a very uh, timely uh, presentation. Uh, so we didn't have to ask you to complete or finish it fast. Yes. So it was very well managed. Uh, and what I see very interesting uh, thing in your presentation was, um, you know, the terminologies like community empowerment or and also participatory planning right from the day one. And when you do the participatory planning, one of the objective is pro for uh, part of development and using micro hydro as a tool for technical social economic development and also what uh, was fascinating was um, because of uh, yeah, this in kind of intervention um, pillagers or the remote people have even gone to the extent of drone technology uh, using cameras for their uh, whatever uh, broadcasting and all that that was very interesting and uh, you will note that there is already a question posted for uh, you uh, project, uh, please uh, look at the chat box. Uh, you don't have to answer it now. Uh, I will let. Uh, I will call upon you uh, when time comes for answering the comments or the questions that that will uh, crop up on chat box. Okay. Uh, now yes, next. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next presentation is uh, now. Is it Biraz now? Dipti. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Biraz uh, is now uh, have been uh, working as a chief executive officer in one of the uh, organization is uh, which we call it People Energy Environment Development Association, PIDA in short, is an NGO. And he has been, uh, you know, uh, in, in, taking initiatives in, not only in the cooking. Uh, his initiatives is very broadly distributed uh, in, in the rural development. And not only productive use or micro hydro, he also does a lot of things on uh, cooking appliances and also other renewable energy and in general enterprise development in the rural areas. 
cold storage uh, using uh, solar energy is some of the thing that he has been involved in the past. He's a very active young man. And uh, over to you, Piras, for your presentation. Thank you, Amata, sir, for your uh, kind words. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, asked for the pardon, so I had to shift from my mobile for this presentation. So I will be uh, uh, not uh, uh, things. Uh, so I will I will take in. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So uh, as a uh, said, like I am Biraj Gautam. I work with uh, People Energy and Environment Development Association. Uh, P uh, PIDA is an NGO based in Kathmandu, Nepal, and we mostly work in energy and environment related tasks. So since past couple of years, we have been uh, looking at the uh, how electric cooking can be in integrated into microhydro. So in my today's presentation, I will mostly focus on uh, the uh, data we uh, we collected uh, over the two years. So I, I will more, mostly focus on the electric cooking only. So in my presentation, I will a uh, little bit touch. Uh, so it's actually uh, Manjarizia and Amatisar has already touched upon. So why it is important, uh, the electric promotion of electric cooking in microhydro. And I'll share a little, little bit about uh, what uh, we found uh, during our uh, research and also some of the learnings we had. So- uh, Biraji, uh, um, do you see the slides? Yes, I can see uh, okay. the slides. Okay, so yes, you, you. you'll let me know when to change. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, um, so to, to set up a little bit context, uh, so there are uh, already more than 3,000 microhydro installed in Nepal. So this has uh, benefited more than 300,000 people. And this achievement was uh, achieved uh, over uh, continuous work of over the 50 years, like Amati sir, Sati sir is there, and so many professional involved uh, to come to this point. So because of uh, these interventions, the communities are benefited very widely uh, from the regular supply of electric electricity for lighting, um, watching televisions and connectivity, and also use of various kinds of productive uh, end uses. So this is so much uh, for us in Nepal who uh, mostly uh, stay at uh, rural areas. However, uh, most of the energy generated from this microhydro are wasted. Uh, some of the studies conducted by RERL. So um, the load factor is around 20% and uh, this kind of uh, load factor utilization goes as low as 5%. Uh, whereas in this microhydro area, there are uh, more than 90% houses who use um, biomass for cooking. So um, even in the uh, mostly inefficient uh, cooking stoves, that's why uh, it has lots of problems in the human health. For example, every year, uh, more than 24,000 Nepalese die because of the indoor air pollution. So in one hand, there is a wastage of energy. So lots of efforts are going on for the productive uh, end use, but uh, they are not uh, quite sufficient. In other hand, so we have problems uh, with the uh, cooking uh, in the energy sector. That's why uh, in PETA, so we thought like how electric cooking can be integrated in these microhydros so that uh, we can uh, implement more uh, clean cooking options for the communities at uh, microhydro. Uh, so next slide, please, Diti. So far, uh, we have uh, done three uh, projects in the microhydro powers. Uh, in the off-grid microhydro projects. Now we are doing a specific study on electric pressure cooker, which will also compare uh, differences between on-grid and off-grid experiences. Our previous studies were completed in a six months of time. The current study will run for a year. That means we'll understand how the perception of users changes over time uh, in the electric cooking sector. Next slide, please, uh, Dipti. Uh, the, these are the, these pictures are some of the methodology we used uh, to collect the data. So we uh, went to different microhydro places, 
and uh, we collected uh, the uh, cooking data and cooking diary and uh, we also collected uh, the cooking fuel information uh, by weighing them and also we used uh, uh, elect electricity electric data logger to collect the energy consumption data and also we used uh, the data logger in the powerhouse so that we monitor the demand and supply side uh, regularly uh, so this is the overall methodology we did uh, to our research projects next slide please Dipti. So in the beginning, we started with these uh, four types of electric cookie stoves. One is induction hops, another is uh, infrared cookie stoves, and low wattage uh, electric cooker and also electric pressure cooker. So from the people's perceptions, uh, the induction hops and electric pressure cookers were most uh, preferred. That's why we choose these two, two technology in our following research. Next slide, please, Dipti. So these are the, some of the pictures like people using different technology in their homes and uh, uh, they had quite a good experience. I uh, just wanted to show the pictures. Next slide, please, Dipti. So uh, in these graphs, uh, this is basically came from the cooking diary data. So this graph provides an insight of the cooking schedule. From these graphs, it uh, reveals that normally in the project type, two to three meals are cooked each day, morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, in these graphs, uh, in the afternoon means there is a little bit uh, difference between uh, baseline and electric cooking phase. So this was basically uh, the baseline cooking data was collected uh, during the off office off school time. That's why people cooked uh, 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 afternoon snacks in the food. Yes, so the early morning fix start at 7 a.m. and there was slightly shift in cooking time in the transition phase with respect with the baseline. The morning fix is of similar width in each phase, implying similar cooking times in each phases. So uh, people spend similar time during the uh, baseline phase and electric cooking phase. Next slide, please, uh, Dipti. So basically, this graph is from the uh, power powerhouse data logger. This graph is the load profile at powerhouse. Uh, the start and end of the two daily peaks were observed. The morning peak is characterized by a play to type peak, while the evening peak was characterized by a sharp peak. The morning peak was 2.8 hours long, while the evening peak was relatively short, spanning to 1.7 hours. Uh, both the peaks of the cooking hours fall in the two peak hours. This graph shows the load uh, with some load management and maybe slight shifting to the cooking hours. Uh, that can add more households who can cook in the electricity for better experience. So, uh, so this graphs a little bit shows the load management things. And uh, um, yeah, we have been uh, uh, also uh, practicing the load management in our following project. So yeah, so this uh, this is actually the uh, people choosing different oh, oh, types of fuels. Uh, um, I'm not sure who is not muted. Sorry for that, Biraji. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe I continue. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, yes. Uh, this, this graph shows that, like, uh, in the rural Nepal, people use different type of cooking stoves. Uh, so, um, fuel stacking is quite common in, uh, over there. They mainly used for cooking purpose. Uh, the fuel stacking was mainly for the cooking purpose rather than lighting. Uh, in all of our project sites, uh, we, we observed multiple cooking fuel were used. When there was reliable ele electricity available, people continued cooking in electricity, which was observed in our exit survey uh, that uh, we conducted after two months of our actual field, in field interventions. However, in the winter months, uh, people uh, used uh, electric cooking as well as biomass stoves. When we asked the community, they told us that the wood stove was used mainly for space heating and cooking for lentils. Uh, next slide, please, Dipti. Uh, this uh, slide, I just wanted to present the cost of cooking. Normally, biomass cooking uh, in the community uh, is free of cost, but in case uh, in case they need to purchase the biomass for cooking, then uh, with the uh, local uh, 
cost of biomass. So they spent around 1,770 rupees, Nepalese rupees. Whereas uh, when they cooked uh, same amount of food for five family members for a month, then uh, the households had to spend like 434 rupees. So that's why like uh, cooking in electricity was quite cheaper than fuel wood. Uh, so without kind kinding health issues and other things. So this uh, chart shows like on an average, uh, for one household consumed 62 kilowatt hour electricity. Uh, with the evening load management, we could implement 50 EPCs in 100 kilowatt site in one of the district in Eastern Nepal. So uh, without doing much more things and only adding this uh, 50 EPCs, now the uh, micro hydro power can earn 21,000 rupees more than they normally used to do that. And uh, so this amount is uh, normally equivalent to the expenses of one operator for that micro hydro. Next slide, please, Dipti. Sorry for the slow changes. Um, okay. So, okay. So I. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, add some of the more things like uh, if we want to uh, implement more uh, uh, more electric cooking in uh, any project areas, so then we might, uh, uh, so the existing supply might not be sufficient to the whole uh, community. So we did little bit research on uh, what uh, can be implemented so that we can, uh, we can uh, supply electricity to uh, for cooking in many households. So yeah, so maybe uh, sometime we might need to choose the storage as well. Uh, so the nighttime electricity in the micro hydro is completely wasted, and if we can integrate that into the uh, energy storage, uh, for example, in battery and all these things, that can uh, significantly uh, significantly increase the income of the micro hydro power as well as uh, supply the uh, electricity for cooking. So when we, uh, so this is basically uh, the people, uh, people's experience from our current research project. Like most of the peoples, they have been enjoying the cooking in electricity. So some of the uh, problems they had with the uh, reliability, sometime like they, are, they have started cooking and suddenly there is no electricity, those kind of things. Uh, otherwise, like many uh, people now continue with the electric uh, cooking, uh, cooking with the electricity. So uh, we feel like uh, the uh, electric cooking is socially welcoming and also technically uh, feasible in the micro hydro power plants. So with this note, I end my presentation here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so maybe that went a uh, little bit uh, later. So just like I covered what were the key learning. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Viraji. Uh, you're, you're right on time. Uh, I will hand it over to Amatya ji. Okay, thank you, Viraj. <laughs> it was interesting presentation, basically. <clears throat> what I take out uh, for me from your presentation is that uh, does not contribute much to the load curve uh, improvement, but it can still help, uh, you know, increase in income for micro hydro, uh, micro hydro, micro hydro, at least, uh, you know, take the burden of one operator's salary, uh, which itself is very important one. And, and apart from that, what I see is uh, by adopting electric cooking using micro hydro power, not only increases the revenue, but it can really indirectly help micro hydro sustainability because uh, you are reducing the use of fuel wood. That means you are uh, contributing to the catchment area management. Again, that Augustus was talking in the morning, in the beginning. So if you can reduce uh, forest and biomass use uh, with electric cooking, then it's definitely going to contribute to the better water management in the catchment area. Um, ultimately contributing to the better water for 
more water for hydro power, micro hydro power, uh, micro hydro power. That's my, my uh, take out from your presentation. And thank you very much, uh, Biras. Now going to Jivan Malik Ji's presentation. Uh, he's basically an uh, electrical engineer and he works as a solar power expert in alternative energy promotion centers, uh, rural energy, renewable energy for rural livelihood project. Uh, he has a master's degree from IIT uh, and along with that the long experience especially with uh, APC and APC related organizations working as solar power experts and he, recently he has been uh, intensively involved in uh, <coughs> micro hydro uh, in connecting micro hydro projects to the grid and uh, I had uh, many opportunities to interact with him on <clears throat> this particular issue. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome him to the presentation. Mr. Malik, it's over to you. Thank you, Amate, sir, for kind introduction. Uh, let me set the context for my presentation before going into the slide. So the, whatever the effort we will be putting in the micro hydro for, for utilization of uh, electricity, by promoting productive usage or by promoting electric cooking. The bitter truth is that uh, the micro hydro solution, the com community takes the micro hydro solution until when there is a no main grid arrive in their vicinity. So micro hydro, the, this is a bitter truth that micro community still takes as a micro hydro as a uh, stop gap solution, kind of a stop gap solution. It's not the main solution or long-term sustainable solution for them. Whenever the grid arrives, main grid arrives in the settlement, they switch into the main grid, main grid, mainly because they, they feel that the main grid are more sustainable and they don't uh, need to bear the hassle for the operation and maintenance for individual standalone micro hydro systems. So this is the problem that Nepal and other also SPNet member countries are facing. So we come up with the solution that whenever the grid arrives in the uh, uh, community, uh, the, the opportunity is that uh, we can interconnect into the main grid and that will support into the economic empowerment of the community. That's the more, I think, benefit, the most of the benefit of the micro hydro they see in the, at the, in the community level. So with this context, I, I enter into the, my presentation before, uh, explaining this slide just for the common under understanding, I would like to go with the definition of centralized generation, distributed generation, and standalone. So, centralized generation we generally refer to the megawatt scale of generation, which is far from load center. So, probably of uh, hundreds or few thousands of kilometer away from the uh, load center, and we bring through the transmission lines. So distributed generation is usually the grid connected system in the vicinity of the load center. Where there is a load center, we can have a generation system over there, but it is a grid connected system. So we refer generally distributed generation and then a standalone system, which is a, a micro hydro serving to the uh, community, but it is not connected to the grid. So this is a one roadmap I'm showing for the distributed generation that they uh, Australian distribution company. Uh, they have a like in 2025, they have a vision of bringing 1% of distributed generation to 53% distributed generation and minimize the centralized generation, 38%. They have a like in 2016, they have a 98% of centralized generation and they will minimize by minimize to 38% by 2025. And in 2050, they have in the long-term vision, they have uh, like 82% of distributed generation. So owing the fact that uh, the advantage of the distributed generation, Nepal also, the, especially the alternative energy promotion center also uh, realized to switch from the standalone uh, community-based uh, migrate hydro system to distributed generation. So whenever the grid arrives in the community, we can in, uh, we, we will have opportunity to interconnect into the uh, national grid, main grid. So the main advantage uh, is that loss reduction. Whenever the, you have a generation closure to the point of consumption, you no need to bring uh, power from hundreds of kilometers away from uh, your load center. So there is a minimization of IS per hour loss. Also, there is an improvement of the quality of the grid that will support into the, like they, they will boost up the voltage. Also, they will contribute whenever the momentary fault, voltage right through or frequency right through, 
uh, your interconnected micro hydro uh, system will support into those fault ride through conditions. And another, if the because of the micro hydro interconnection, because of the fault ride through capability, uh, if your line is not tripping, that means you, the service is going to improve. Also, there is also like reduction in the cost of the system. No need to invest for the um, for the substation, large substation, and also the uh, for the infrastructure like transmission and distribution. And the most uh, another one beauty is that greening the grid. That means it's like in case of Nepal, we are still importing 22% of electricity from neighboring country India, and we know that those electricity are not very uh, I mean clean. Still, there are some. Uh, major percentage is uh, coal, and and still there are uh, carbon emission uh, from those coal-fired uh, power generations. So the grid interconnection of micro hydro in Nepal is uh, evolved like in we started at in 2011, and our utility agreed in 2014 July that we we can interconnect micro hydro system into the grid. We had a technical standard, we drafted technical standard jointly by utility and AEPC, and which has been agreed by the board of uh, utility, Nepal Electricity Authority. And then again, uh, it takes two years to conclude the first PPA for the micro hydro. Uh, there was some confusion in, in the board decision. Uh, in, indeed, the board said that when a micro hydro is receiving subsidy during the construction, uh, whenever the conceptualize of uh, standalone micro hydro receive the substantial subsidy. So we cannot provide the same uh, PPA tariff as in the IPP. So our advocacy is that this is a small scale and this will not be viable if you will be reducing the PPA tariff, uh, uh, commercial PPA tariff. So ultimately utility convinced and then it took two years to convince again and first PPA has been concluded in 2016 February. So again, it took two years to finalize uh, interconnect first micro hydro system into the grid. In this two year, um, we, we developed the technology for the in grid interconnection of micro hydro. Indeed, you all know that micro hydro technology is based on the ELC, electronic load control. It's not the governor based, which is readily available in the market. And hundreds of university do research every day for the governor based hydro. But the, for the ELC based, Mm -hmm. micro hydro systems, you will not be finding the many research papers. So we, we had uh, some difficulty in finding the technology for the grid interconnected micro hydro on ELC based. So the first interconnected micro hydro we concluded in 2018 January. Then after we interconnected four micro hydro systems uh, ranging from 23 kilowatt to 90 kilowatt. And we had, we learned several experiences from these all uh, micro hydro systems. As I said, uh, we had a several hidden trial for the technology for the grid interconnection of micro hydro, ELC based micro hydro systems. And we also conducted few simulation studies before going into the technology. So our publication is also available if someone is a, more interested on the technical stuffs, uh, our publication is available in uh, IEEE. And then also in terms of financial aspect, we have seen that uh, the Financial viability totally depends upon the capacity and how far is your grid available from the, your micro hydro systems. Let's say if uh, uh, the grid is available, let's say for 50 kilowatt, this red line is for the 50 kilowatt. And if grid is available for five kilometer away, still the, this IRR is a financial indicator. IRR is a 29%. This is still attractive, much more than the um, commercial interest rate provided by the banks. So it is still uh, attractive. Whenever you go into like, uh, if you are connecting 50 kilowatt of micro hydro system at the distance of 10 kilometer, the IRR comes to 12% only. So I, I would say that still, this is a marginally viable, but it probably if you will be going lower than the 50 kilowatt at the interconnection distance of 10 kilometers, probably it will not be uh, financially attractive for you. So it, and I'm, and, 
for this analysis, I'm neglecting the capital investment during the construction of the micro hydro. This is a capital investment taken uh, for the grid interconnection of micro hydro. I'm assuming that micro hydro system is well functionally functioning, and then I will be putting only the control systems and other um, equipments required by the utility. So those capital costs are only involved in this analysis. And this financial aspects is also in, um, included in the paper, IEEE paper, which I said in earlier slide. And this is the first uh, micro hydro system we interconnected into the grid. The impact you can see uh, for the from the grid perspective. Uh, before interconnecting the micro hydro, the voltage of the grid was uh, 370 volt. Just after interconnection, this increases to 382 volt. So you can see the improvement in the in the um, uh, voltage voltage improvement because of the. It, power injection at the distribution level because of the interconnection of micro hydro. So another beauty like uh, uh, Biraji also said that uh, the plant low utilization of micro hydro in a standalone mode. So usually the micro hydro system merely meets 25% of plant load factor. So the, with the grid interconnection, this increases to uh, 77%. This is the, another beauty that we achieve through the grid interconnection of micro hydro. That means in revenue increases by threefold. So like in this, um, there is a one uh, plot here. This is based on the PPA calendar months. This is Nepali month, Falgun, Chetra. These are the PPA calendar month, PPA energy table. So the blue bar is the expected one and this red bar is the actual revenue that micro hydro earned. So expected revenue like annual revenue was uh, around 9,000 uh, from the, this 23 kilowatt. But he has earned, he has able to earn only 7,000. This is mainly because of the unavailability of the NEA means utility feeder line. Whenever the, there is no um, grid, uh, you, you cannot sell electricity into the, um, the grid or maybe into the uh, community. You, you have, for the selling of the electricity, you have to have a grid available there in writing your micro hydro system. So mainly because of the 11 k outage of the feeder line. So this is our experience so that we should not go into the 400 volt interconnection of micro hydro system. Whenever you will be going into 400, there will be more outage and you will be losing more revenue. The availability of the 400 line will be lesser than the availability of the 11 kV line. So this is learning. Also in 400 volt line, we, ha we have encountered several uh, technical issues also. These days, uh, you know, there are electronic welding machines. And if the community is using electronic welding machine, that is also causing the tripping of the micro hydros, grid interconnected micro hydro. We have encountered such kind of problems in 400 volt. So it is not good to connect into the 400 systems. So recently, with these learnings, recently utility also get confident and recently uh, utility also opened for the net metering of the micro hydro systems. So this has been uh, the first net metering of the micro hydro system. Uh, mini hydro system is in, concluded in 2019 of 600 kilowatt salary chalsa uh, uh, owned by the NEA and Good Nepal right Electricity right. Authority. And the net metering rate is uh, of 7.1 US cent for the six months and 4.1 cent for the another six months. And recently also with this, these are the 200 kilowatt and 750 kilowatt is uh, APC promoted uh, mini hydro systems. We have also concluded two net metering in the last month only. This is a 200 kilowatt already constructed in Simrutu Khola in Rukum. And probably we will be interconnecting this uh, 200 kilowatt Simrutu within two months of time. So another way forward is like IMPM. This uh, so government of Nepal, APC and utility NEA both agreed to prepare the master plan for grid interconnection of uh, micro hydro systems. So this is the IMPM activity is still going on. Uh, so this, once upon this IMPM will be finalized, uh, we will have a roadmap for the grid interconnection of micro hydro, and this IMPM will be also included 100 micro hydro. Uh, projects which has a readily available feasibility study. So the utility also agree on this IMPM. And uh, after this IMPM, our, again, the grid interconnection work will rapidly uh, escalate. And currently, you know, the 
we have concluded we have interconnected first micro in 2018 and then after there is uh, no interconnection happens because in between the regulatory um, electricity regulatory commission come into the picture and there are just some kind of uh, confusion in between erc role and ea roles so not only for the micro hydro also for the other large hydro systems the ppa uh, was kind of uh, uh, disrupt PPA process was disrupted in last two years. So now we are hoping that this uh, after the IMPM, we will have a uh, probably uh, every year we will be interconnecting more than 20 micro hydro systems into the grid. And another development we have, uh, like uh, we had uh, several learnings, especially also in the uh, some procedural bureaucratic hurdles and also in the technical steps. So we also, we are also preparing the simplified PPA for the, especially for the uh, micro mini hydro systems of less than one megawatt capacity. So this SPPA will be concluded, probably will be available by October, 2021. So most of the things are um, already finalized, both from the NEA and APC working level. And it is now uh, pending at the NEA utility management, senior management uh, team. So we are hoping that it will be available, SPPA will be available by October, 2021, which will support the IMPM activity as well. So the, this is a draft SPPA. I've just, I would like to highlight this yellow uh, highlights. We have also opened uh, induction generator for less than 20 kilowatt, which was not earlier. Earlier it was mandatory to have a synchronous generator for in for grid interconnection. Now the utility agreed to interconnect induction generator up to 20 kilowatt, and also the we uh, the earlier we have a only provision for interconnecting to 11 kV. So utility also agreed to interconnect 200, less than 200 less than 20 kilowatt migrator system in 400 volt but still like i said the problem the financial loss in 400 in volt interconnection uh, so they, they have also given choice for the they agreed to given choice for the both for the 400 volt and 11 kb so also there we also read, um, agreed to reduce the some control um, features like contact um, contract contactor and acb earlier we Mm, there was a mandatory to use VCB. VCB itself is a kind of uh, like 50% of uh, cost for the grid interconnection of existing micro hydro system. So for the less than 85 kilowatt, utility agreed to uh, um, remove this VCB provision for the grid interconnection. These are the major changes in the SPPA. And we also, we structurally well defined the uh, all the protection systems. If uh, any of HPNet member will need help, we will be supporting on these technical stuff as well. So this is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Jeevan Bhai, for the exciting developments. Uh, Amatya ji, we, we will actually be all transferred to the main session in about nine minutes. So okay. however you want to use this. Uh, and and we can overflow in the networking part too. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have many questions on the chat box right now. Uh, there was one question for Ibeka that uh, uh, Pradigda might want to answer. After that, uh, there is uh, another question. No, there is no question at all. So I don't think we really need to spend a lot of time on second round. Uh, predict the, can you quickly answer that one question that you got? Uh, yes, so basically regarding the experience collaborating with local university and technical college to bring the engineering expertise, basically in Ipeka experience, uh, each country has their own policy for internship, for example. So for the U.S., uh, the students that doing the internship are not allowed to do work. They only being presented the topic to learn. While in Indonesia, student is more broad. But the similarity is that they, even though they can have research and development, they have very limited time, resources, and the personnel for the research and development. And now we are focusing more on the cross flow turbine and productive usage. And okay. basically we exchange the student with uh, sustainable development experience, social empowerment, and rural economy in the site. So they visit the site. 
So thank you. Okay, thank you. Dipti had a question, I think, uh, from Dipti to everyone, uh, for Mandari ji. Uh, PEU in the catchment area, this catchment area is not uh, water catchment area. This catchment area, if I am correct, is a catchment uh, area that the micro hydro solves, you know, the locality, the geographical locality that micro hydro solves is the um, PEU catchment area. That's what we used to discuss or we, we used yes. to define. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Okay, I think uh, with that, uh, all the questions are actually completed. Um, how many minutes do we have now? Uh, we have about six minutes, Amadiaji. Okay. Uh, we, I have been uh, summarizing the presentation immediately after the presentation as such. So I don't think I need the time to do that now. Uh, uh, as we, as I said, uh, there was uh, the the first presentation of Manjuri um, highlighted the uh, you know the challenges uh, and also empowerment. Those two things I want to re re revisit or re repeat. And uh, again, institutional development was very important aspect from the project uh, presentation, uh, and also the participatory approach in planning was uh, very fascinating. And similarly, uh, cooking, and we already discussed that uh, cooking not only contributes to the income, but also could help uh, in the catchment area, hydrologically catchment area, again now, uh, this different catchment area. Hydrological catchment area uh, management can also benefit from the electrical cooking. And similarly, Jivanji has uh, <coughs> highlighted uh, the current uh, development in Nepal about on grid connecting, which uh, I think uh, SPNet can take some of the credits for that, uh, because uh, until we took some of our NEA friends to Sri Lanka to show them how small micro hydros can be connected to the grid. Uh, so uh, we took some of the officials to Sri Lanka and that really made a big difference uh, in the thinking process of some of the very senior officials in Nepal Electricity Authority and also the continuous reports of AEPC like, from the people like Jivan uh, Satish and um, uh, the current executive director Madhusudan uh, really helped uh, with, of course, help from different people in the sector uh, materialize this grid interconnection to this scale. Uh, I'm quite happy to notice that as well. Uh, with that, I will uh, stop myself uh, summarizing the today's uh, proceeding and over to uh, Dipti before we go back to the main session now. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much, Amatyaji, for the excellent moderation um, and for and to all of the panelists for taking time to prepare your wonderful presentations and uh, sharing with us. Uh, if you have any last words from any of the panelists, um, uh, you can feel free to share. We have um, about three minutes. And after that, we will all be moved to the main session room. And there we can uh, see who needs a 30 minute break from everything, or if any people want to stay on and have a, a networking break. So. Uh, I would like to highlight one thing and uh, we are also working on the technology development for the grid interconnection with several universities and we are still struggling to find the appropriate technology though we have a um, few interconnection micro hydro but still we are looking for some collaboration with universities uh, who can uh, support us on the technology finding especially the appropriate technology I would say that uh, mainly for the AVR and ELC, if I have to highlight. So we are open for the collaboration and also requesting HPNet to help us on the technology uh, support. We are also working with, uh, recently we work with uh, UPI University of Canada and also Bristol University and also Duke University, but still we are on the way, um, but not getting the solutions. So this is one highlight I would like to put here and also seeking for some kind of support from SPNet members or member countries. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jeevan Bhai. Uh, that's uh, very important that you reached out. Maybe there are people in our audience who can help with that. 
I just want to thank Amatya ji again for, uh, for always guiding us. And uh, yeah, since the start of the network, uh, you really always motivated us and made sure we focused on the right themes. So thank you. Okay. okay thank you from my side also to everyone, uh, including uh, panelists and Dipti also for um, bringing nice words to me. Thank you very much as well. Uh, Augustus, you are still around, I guess. Uh, thank you and nice to hear you today. And we will be going back to main room. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and also I have some other um, appointments, so I will not be in the next session and the remaining of the day. Okay. And hopefully tomorrow I will try to join again. Yes, we will send you, uh, there will be recordings and slides for everything. Thank you. Okay, everyone, see you in the main room then.